Good morning, everyone. My talk is called The Better Base for Understanding. I have worked with trying to make computers understand things like natural language for about 15 years, and I have learned quite a few things, and quite a few things that may be different from what other people think about AGI. And so therefore, I'd also like to share what I've learned in this. So I learned a bunch of things that I, about AI and singularity, and so we'll see um, what you, how you like this. Quick overview of this talk. I'm going to be talking about something called dual process theory. I'll discuss some consequences for AI and the singularity, and I'm going to go through, if I have the time, I have about 40 minutes, I'm going to go through the um, uh, focus questions, the conference theme questions at the end. <coughs> and this is a very short talk if you want more, and you have to go to my website, syntense.com, and there's a links page that has all my published materials. Uh, this is uh, Daniel Kahneman, and he wrote a book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and it's mostly about dual process theory. He wasn't the first one to uh, talk about that. It, many people have talked about it ever since uh, William James in 1890. And the idea is very simple. It basically says that brains use two different modes of thinking. They use an intuitive understanding and a logical reasoning. And they're different. Let's look at the differences. Understanding is fast, that's, uh, and uh, reasoning is slow, and hence the title of uh, Kahneman's book. And understanding gets its speed from being mostly parallel, and re reasoning by necessity is a step-by-step -step process. Understanding is intuitive, reasoning is logical. Understanding is subconscious. We cannot understand how we understand. Nobody here, for instance, knows how they understand language or how they generate it. Whereas reasoning is conscious, it's a very much a conscious effort. You have to think about everything you do. Understanding is involuntary, and reasoning is voluntary. And we can basically look at any of these properties of these two modes, and we can make experiments um, and other things, but there's one, one of these has a very fast um, test. We can basically use the last one here for a little thought experiment. Suppose you're planning a European vacation. You need to decide on the cities to visit, the size to see, and so on, and make the itinerary. And planning is a very typical form of reasoning. You can take a break, have dinner, continue the next day. Contrast this with understanding language. It's subconscious, instantaneous, and involuntary. Once you learn to understand English, you cannot turn it off. Once you learn to understand English, you cannot turn. This is enough to convince me that dual process theory is correct. And it's also rather clear to me that reasoning sits on top of understanding. Um, we can look at, for instance, the evolutionary record. The earlier animals, uh, they, under, they reason much less than we do. Dogs, for instance, they um, understand a lot, but they don't reason much. It's also clear that the role of uh, reasoning has been exaggerated, because that's the one we can see when, we're, when we introspect. So we think that it's more important than it actually is. Can we estimate how important reasoning really is? Well, we can look at the incoming bandwidth to the brain, which is about 10 megabits from the eyes and a little bit more from a few other sources. And multiple psychological studies have shown that we only consciously wear about 100 bits per second. Numbers vary from 40 to 140 or so. So brains only spend about 0.001% of their cycles on reasoning. And that's like a factor of 100,000 to 1. And what's happening in the subconscious is a data reduction and an epistemic reduction where we discard that which is irrelevant, or at least that what we believe is irrelevant. 
And this processing takes about 500 milliseconds, which is known as the Libet delay. We are actually all living 500 milliseconds, half a second in the past, and our brain patches over that so that we don't go crazy. So reasoning, by all measures, should be just a paint-thin layer on top of our understanding. And in the 20th century, artificial intelligence community was overly concerned with this reasoning part, to almost to the exclusion of everything else. And now it's time to take a look at the understanding part. And that's what my artificial intuition research is all about. Let's step back and ask ourselves, why did we focus on reasoning so heavily? Well, we lured by the amazing power of reductionism, uh, which is, in my opinion, the greatest invention our species has ever made. Uh, it is uh, it truly, uh, it underlies all science, it underlies most of our problem solving, and we are not aware that this is such an important invention because we are surrounded by it all the time, like fish in water. Reductionism is exactly the use of models. Uh, models are theories, equations, scientific models, naive models that we don't publish, computer programs. Models are simplifications of our rich reality. We take our rich reality, we can't stick it into a calculator and do any computation. We have to first throw away that which doesn't matter so we know what is important and we have to measure that. Now we have numbers, we can use calculators, we get a result, we have to apply it back to our rich reality. And reasoning requires models of this kind. When we do our reasoning, we typically deal with models, internal models, or even explicit ones like F equals MA, Newton's second law, whatever. So, like good scientists, AI researchers in the 1950s, they started modeling the world because that was the obviously scientific thing to do. Unfortunately, comprehensive world models are intractable. Um, you cannot model the entire world, so what you are forced to do is model a small chunk of it, and now this small chunk, you have to basically pull it out, yank it out of the rest of the world, and it's a painful operation, you get these ragged edges, and when, you, when your model reaches, when you basically want to use competence at the edges of the model, uh, you are very likely uh, to make uh, spectacular and, and big mistakes. And we had inclination that this was a problem a long time ago. Um, John McCarthy and Pat Hayes in 1969 published uh, what is known as the Frame Problem paper. And the paper basically states that the world changes behind your back. And any comprehensive world model that you make is immediately obsolete. So the AI community responded with switching to solving to basically doing AI in only limited domains, specific cases that they could wrap a bunch of code around, and to toy problems. But toy problems aren't really all that great for um, getting to artificial general intelligence. We can draw a diagram here which plots context complexity, with, that is how rich is the world, how many parts interact in this problem, and the problem complexity on the x-axis that basically states how complicated is the problem itself. And up here we have the observed region where basically we can't do anything. Um, this is things like um, the global economy or, uh, or human physiology and drug interactions. All of these things are extremely complex um, and the problem statements are very difficult. So we can't do anything in here. But if we stay close to the axis, we can get something done. And down here is the domain of logic of reasoning, and up here is the domain of intuitive understanding. We can see that the brain is very nicely made to handle both cases. Down here is rocket science. Up here is things like language. Um, down here we have pool balls in the corner. And pool balls, we can view pool balls as collision of elastic objects under conservation of momentum or we can go downtown and shoot some pool and learn how to do, how pool balls behave by intuition, holistically, if you will. So we can do, solve problems with pool balls either way. So here, either one may work. Over here, reasoning outperforms understanding, and over here, understanding outperforms reasoning. And outperforms is actually a very like an understatement, because it's basically completely, almost completely impossible. It depends on how far out of 
range you get from, uh, uh, from the other. So the reductionist AI, like any scientific discipline, works down here in the uh, reductionist area with problems with contexts that are not too complex. But they can do a lot of complicated things in the problem domain. And over here are the true AI problems, such as language. And they have very complex contexts, but uh, the problems are very simple. And so the AI toy problems were down in this region. And we had multiple cases. Multiple Hello. Did we change? <laughs> Hello. All right. Uh, we had multiple um, successes with in these AI toy problems, but they have all been like false promises because we can't really get past this line here, and so we can't get into the true AI problem area. So we should be using what I call holistic, which is context-exploiting AI, or model-free methods, which is uh, a, a group of methods that, uh, that uh, we can use for this purpose. Our popular toy AI technologies will not scale to general intelligence. We have all kinds of technologies that we've been using for the past 60 years, and many are still in common use on limited AI, limited domain AI problems. But they all assume that intelligence is based on reasoning rather than intuition. Also, our popular definitions for AGI may be incorrect. A common definition for AGI is the ability of a computer or other machine to perform those human activities that are normally thought to require intelligence. But this means that playing chess and solving integrals are AI problems. But no, we have actually had computers have been solving those problems quite nicely for several years. So I like to claim the opposite. I claim that a better definition is uh, that artificial general intelligence is the ability of a computer to perform those human activities that are normally thought not to require intelligence. <coughs> this is things like Understanding language, generating language, knowing how to sequence your leg muscles as you walk across the floor, knowing how to enjoy a symphony. These are things that computers cannot do effectively or at all. So doing what we do without reasoning has to be the first step towards true AGI. Some consequences of dual process theory and all of these ideas for AGI and singularity. Let's look at properties of a possible AGI, as opposed to an impossible one. We have plenty of impossible ones. Now, I claim that all the reductionist model-based ones that we saw based on those technologies are never going to make it to AGI. Uh, they are basically they are postulating an impossible kind of AGI. We also have all the fictional AGI like uh, that you see on television screens and Skynet and whatnot. These are all impossible. So, properties. All intelligence is all intelligent agents are fallible, without exception. This follows directly from the frame problem. The world changes behind your back. You will make mistakes, whether you use models or not, in fact. So best effort given the available information is the best thing we can ever do. All intelligence are also limited, and unlimited intelligence would be infallible. So. Intelligence, is, has, intelligence itself has limits. And it's limited by world complexity, not by technology. You can get a 10 times bigger computer and much better code and whatever, but, uh, but basically the, the, the limit of intelligence is the fact that the world is complex, that it changes behind your back. And if you add more AGI to the world, it gets more complex. So you can't really win here. Furthermore, recursive self-improvement, which is the idea that the computer can improve its own programming and get better and better and better, and we can have a runaway AGI, is it also has limits because as programmers know, you fix a few bugs, you're going to introduce more bugs, and as complexity grows, even an AGI can't keep track of it. So recursive self-improvement also has limits. I don't believe in computers that continuously improve themselves uh, forever and ever or even significantly. 
Understanding is a requirement, as I said. Uh, language understanding is easiest. <clears throat> it's in very high demand, very lucrative. It's worth about a trillion dollars if you can solve the generalized uh, language understanding problem. Reasoning ability is not a requirement. You can make breakfast, with, breakfast without reasoning. You can drive your car down the freeway without reasoning. You can sequence your leg, you can walk across the floor without reasoning about your leg muscles. And many human professions, many human professions are within range of people who don't know how to do reasoning or whatever, or computers that didn't know how to do reasoning. Some more non-requirements of AGI. No consciousness. We, they don't need consciousness. We can have useful, uh, uh, lucrative, so to speak, AGI without them being conscious. I think consciousness is a big red herring. Uh, if we pursue that, it's gonna, we're going to waste our time. And we can <coughs> focus on simple things like understanding first. We don't even need a writable long-term memory. We can imagine a, a computer, an AGI, that, for instance, learns English or maybe a dozen languages. And then we flip the switch and make the memory read-only. The long-term memory becomes read-only. And um, we can still keep a short-term memory in there. But it knows language, but it can't learn anything more. So now we can give it web pages to classify, for instance. And it looks at the web page, and it says, it's about this and that. It's this good, and uh, this much is novel, which would be very, very useful. You can see the trillion dollar coming down the line, just not being able to do that. And then once it's read the web page, we reset the whole short-term memory, and it starts over with the next one. It doesn't have long-term memory. It doesn't remember anything. Every web page is like new. You've seen this. There's a movie about 21st dates or whatever it was called, which is like this. There is no need for multiple kinds of sensory inputs. We don't need both hearing and eyes and whatever. We can have a computer that only has an input sense of text. You feed in characters from the web in it, and it, it la learns language from that. Um, and if you think that's everybody that I talked to about learning from books, they basically say, no, 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 in order to understand the word, you have to see the object. Well, nobody's in a proton. We read about them in books, but we can still make nuclear power plants and stuff like that. So that's not entirely true. Uh, and also, inside of the brain, the neurons are... They, in the brain, there is no sight, no hearing, no smell, nor touch. It's all neuron signaling neurons. And neurons have to learn and do whatever they do by nothing else than communicating to other neurons. And they don't know if the signal that comes into them comes from the eyes or the ears or the tongue. They have no clue. So, therefore, Multiple kind of sensory input argument is not correct. Also, they don't need mobility. They don't need to move around. People who embodiment and enactment are two very popular terms in the, in the AI community that discuss, basically, they claim that in order for an AI, AGI to be intelligent, it has to move around and learn about the world. Well, I usually say that the embodiment people have noticed what the problem is with models versus uh, uh, with reductions versus holistic thing, but they haven't come up with a solution. So they just observe that AGI is not going to work unless we do something else, unless we look at the rich world. But they don't actually, nobody in that community has given me an idea how to deal with the input data that you get as you're moving around. No agency. These AGIs will do what they told. We tell them to sort web pages, they will do it all day long. They don't have a will of their own. No personhood, no right to life, no social privileges. Wait a moment, isn't that slavery? It's not even slavery. Cattle-level AGI will be given cattle-level privileges. Um, there is a parrot that died a few years ago that learned 300 words of English. It would count to 10, and it knew all the several colors. And you would give it a tray of things, and you say, how many red things? And it would say, four. Um, and it basically had a command of basic English with a brain the size of a hazelnut. And a cow has a much bigger brain than that. If a cow didn't have to worry about eating grass and making more cows and all kinds of other stuff like that, 
you could focus on English and we could teach it a language and it would probably learn all of English. And a, a computer with roughly the same powers could certainly do that. So these kind of software systems, it's just software running on your laptop, if you will, or in a server somewhere. It's okay to turn it off anytime you want. And if you're worried about the ethical implications of turning off your AGI, just make a backup and store it in a box in the attic. You can take it out anytime you want, but AGI from six years ago may not be as important as, or as interesting as the current one. This is still general artificial general intelligence. It's general, it can learn anything. It can learn any language. It can learn things like DNA or whatever. The kind of AGI is more important than the IQ that it has. We gotta do things right. We gotta do things based on the holistic ideas rather than on the reductionist ideas. And that's the biggest thing. And once we get that right, we can start small and grow our way up. So a cattle level understanding machine is still a general artificial intelligence. It's just not human level. It may be more human-like than many other things we have tried so far, but it doesn't have to be human level. And we can just limit them to understanding language. Same algorithm works for other domains, some things like vision, DNA, music, vehicles, and robotics. We don't have to change anything. Um, put some other wrapper around it, but the learning algorithm, the understanding algorithm in the middle is the same. Also, something that is often forgotten when we talk about AGI, everybody assumes that we have no AGI, no AGI, and then we have full-blown AGI. Nobody talks about the ramp up, and it will come slowly because we have to figure out a lot of things about it as we go along. So it won't arrive, uh, it won't arrive suddenly. We should start simple, like cattle level intelligence, learn as we go, and improve it slowly. Why are we afraid of AGI? Well, it's naive ideas from certain people who haven't thought these things through, and sensationalism in the media. Skynet, Colossus, Commander Data. An infallible, omniscient, superhuman, godlike AGI is totally impossible. You can quote me on that. <laughs> Unfriendly AI is not a problem. If they're all fallible, we wait until they make a mistake and we pull the plug. Not a big deal. A spectacular AI singularity is unlikely. The reason that we, well, one reason that we have seen so much focus on the kind of AI, AGI technologies that don't really work is because that the practitioner of these things, they are starting out typically as computer programmers. Computer programmers are good scientists. They are the most reductionist profession on the planet. Um, and Therefore, they use these reductionist methods, but they don't have the grounding in epistemology. They haven't given this any thought at the level of epistemology, so they don't understand the problems they're actually facing. Cognition is mostly recognition. You need to recognize what you have encountered before, because if you see something, you, uh, if you're a primitive animal and you've seen something that you've seen before, it didn't eat you last time, you're probably safe to go about your business. But if you see something you've never seen before, maybe you should just stay in your hole for a few minutes. We want, to learn, we want these machines to learn many patterns and patterns of patterns. You start at the sensory input level and you learn what those are like and then you build up from there. And then you match known patterns to any new situation. And you track failures and successes of these patterns and you throw away the ones that don't work as well. And as you're doing this learning, step, layer by layer, starting from the sensor input and laying down layers of abstractions on top of each other, um, we can remember what Patrick Winston said from MIT. He said, you can only learn that which you already almost know, and that's universally true. And this is the justification for deep learning, which is the current sweetheart of the AGI community. Uh, sweet, uh, deep learning is basically Part of that strategy is to, lay, uh, is to lay down layers after another and, and make sure one is fully taught before you move on to the next one. So epistemological AGI would basically understand things like any sufficiently reductionist AI is indistinguishable from programming. In reductionist AI, all intelligence comes from programmers doing the reduction as models reduction to models while they're writing the code. Like I said, programmers are the most reductionist profession. But that's wrong. It's the AGI itself that has to make its own models. This is the distinction. We are not building a 
model of the world using scientific methods. We're building something that can build a model of the world using scientific <coughs> methods. We have to take one meta step away from the obvious scientific solution that we have and, and build something that can do the same thing. So we are basically aiming at machines capable of autonomous reduction. And that's a mouthful, as so I usually say, just understanding machines. And that's my alternative to AGI, is machines that have understanding and not necessarily much more than that. How do we get there? This is Lionel S. Penrose. He happens to be father of Sir Roger Penrose. And he's talked in a paper early on in 1935 about model-free methods. And it was picked up, or rather started again, by Stuart Dreyfus in 2004. Uh, when he wrote uh, a paper called Model Free Methods for Skill Acquisition and Coping, where he discusses exactly how to cope with a complex and ever-changing world. Dreyfus is basically showing, roughly at the same time that I was doing it, how to sidestep the frame problem. So these Model Free Methods, why do we want to use them? Well, reasoning requires models, we said that earlier. Model creation and use requires understanding of the problem domain. You can't make, use, make models or you can't use existing models until you understand the problem. So understanding therefore must precede the reasoning. Therefore, and for other reasons, understanding must be implemented without using models. The, implement, the AI implementers cannot use models at the lower levels of the AGI. And I think they shouldn't be using them anywhere. So therefore, understanding requires model-free methods in humans and in computers. These model-free methods, they can provide things like learning, salience, reduction from the rich reality to model, abstraction, novelty, and emergent robustness. And these are things that you cannot get with the reductionist kind of model-based artificial intelligence. Novelty, for instance, is very few papers have been written in AGI community about how to get useful novelty. Some differences. Model-based requires understanding. Model-free provides understanding. Model-free discards context because we're trying to get down to a model. Model-free exploits this context to do things like disambiguation. Model-free-based methods are nominally correct, so they're based on logic. They better be correct. But uh, uh, model-free methods are often fallible. On the other hand, the model-based methods, because they're logic, they require correct input data. Garbage in, garbage out. Whereas the model-free methods, they operate even on scant evidence, and they're robust against misinformation and errors and missing data and ambiguous data. Model-based methods are brittle because they will fail at the edges of their competence. Like I said before, in spectacular ways, and damn you, autocorrect.com is an example of brittle failures in the language domain. Whereas model-free methods, because of the heavily overlapping patterns um, and redundancy, they are robust against such problems. So, the greatest surprise to AGI researchers is that they need to create computer programs that jump to conclusions on scant evidence. Doesn't sound very scientific, does it? Are our brains really that scientific? They're not. All of these hundreds of, well, hundred plus uh, ways that we can have cognitive biases that are, everybody thinks are such a bad thing, they are directly follow from the fact that we have understanding at all. And yes, we can fight against making mistakes of this kind by understanding the kind of mistakes we're making, but we have to recognize that they're basically the direct consequence of having intelligence, and we, our machines are going to have the same problems. Let me quickly at the end here now go through the conference theme questions uh, so that I get a head start on the panel later. <laughs> What's the most technology, uh, uh, likely technology to achieve AGI? Well, there's only one, and that's model-free methods, but there are very many variants of it. There's deep learning, there's modern connectionism, neural Darwinism, and my brand, which is artificial intuition. I also would like to, again, emphasize that text is much easier than things like video because the diff distance from the sensor input to semantics is the shortest in text. When will we likely achieve human-level general intelligence? Well, mm, human-level general intelligence is a non-goal. Should be, at least initially. Aiming too high, it fools us into choosing technologies that will not work, such as model-based methods. We want it to be perfect. We would want to 
I heard people in the AGI community say, if it's not superhuman, why bother? And this is like so wrong, it's, I, don't, I don't have words for it. Um, a cattle level intelligence in a computer that understands human language would be worth a trillion dollars, I said that. Uh, and this is possible in two to five years using current hardware. We don't even have to have exotic stuff like, I don't know, uh, uh, what is quantum computing or something like that. We can do it in existing uh, uh, von Neumann-like computers. How fast will, it, will its intelligence increase? It's going to be an explosion. Well, I had grant that understanding machines accelerate progress. It's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. But initially, they will like, only understand language, so to speak, and then we move in, out into other domains. But in the language domain, you can use them for search engines, document classifiers, speech input, research assistance, doctor in the box, lawyer in the box, and dialogue-based systems. And we can have decades of fun while we learn and adjust to this kind of intelligence. Cars that understand exactly what we're saying don't need any buttons on the dashboard. They know when we're talking to the car rather than to somebody else in the car and so on. And understanding, as I said, is not just for languages. How serious are the risks? Understanding machines are nothing like the impossible, fictional, infallible, godlike reductionist AI. You can quote me on that also. Understanding machines for starters are not fiction. They're based on epistemology and solid neuron-based theories of learning and salience. Salience is basically knowing what's important. That's a very important <laughs> question for AGI. They are fallible like all other intelligence. And they can understand morals and ethics. If they're fully understanding machines, they should understand things like morals and ethics. The three laws are robotics, ethics, morals, and paperclip maximizers. All laws, such as those on the on the law books of this country are models. Um, they basically, it, they require a human agent or an intelligent agent to interpret the law in context before you can do anything. Goal functions for AGI are also models. Morals require an understanding agent who understand the context, not just the letter of the law. So that's why we have judges and juries that interpret the law, even policemen and so on are doing the same thing. Understanding machines will understand morals, ethics, etc. themselves. Otherwise, they're not understanding. The three laws are a useless fictional reductionist hack. You can quote me on that also. And the paperclip maximizer problem, where a computer, an AGI, decides to make paperclips of the entire universe. It doesn't even pass the smell test for intelligence. Uh, anything that's that stupid is not an intelligent machine. I'm sorry. Uh, and the people who think that that's a problem are confusing um, basically the fact that they th they're thinking from the reductionist point of view, they think they have to write all the rules that make the paperclip maker stop. No, no, it understands when it's enough. Thank you. Oh, for the panel, huh? Go ahead. Actually, no, I don't. I don't want to get ready to do it. First of all, okay. Is anyone from Mary here first? I'll defer to that. I'm going to go back for Mary, actually. Go for it. One of the, some of the things that you said, I guess the, the first thing that I thought was. Is there a microphone for Scott? Can we give him one? So we get. Is no, we want it on the recording. That's what uh, matters. Should I come up there? Uh, I think I left my mic back there. There's a red one right there. Yeah, let's line up the questions. Actually, put it, put it right in front here, so otherwise it won't be in the picture. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. So I guess the first, the first um, thing that I noticed is that I feel like, and this is something that people from Miri have responded to, is that referring to uh, the, like, a lot of modern AI is reductionist is kind of a straw man. And I think you kind of pointed that out yourself. Like, mm -hmm. it, it looks like deep learning is hugely has a huge amount of traction. Correct. It clearly isn't reductionist. Correct. So who are you talking about when you, when you rail against reductionists? How about PsyCorp? 
Okay. Psych has been, PsyCorp has been, uh, is the biggest AI project on the planet. They have from 25 years, they've been had 25 people trying to reduce the world to models using first order predicate calculus. And they have gotten pretty much nowhere. And if you looked at my list of, of, of methodologies, for instance, you have things like the Bayesian uh, uh, logic, for instance, and all of those methods we use in language learning, they are still model-based. Let me tell you how, how easy it is to miss a model. Um, language is comprised of words that are separated by spaces, and the words have meaning. There's two models in there. It's not true for Chinese, for instance. They don't put spaces in. And words don't have a meaning. The word break has 75 meanings in a decent dictionary set might have 400, depends on the dictionary. So that, those things are wrong. And the moment that, uh, that, words, uh, that uh, language is those words, you end up having, you modeling the word. Now you have to do things like stemming because are two different words and so on. So all of these problems in the language understanding community such as it is today, modern natural language processing, for instance, is models wall to wall. And nobody there tries to get anywhere using model free methods. But Monica's going to be on a panel later, and everybody can ask Monica. I'm going to beat up on Monica more later. Yeah, beat up on her at I think it's 1:30. Okay.